Chapter 1 of A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga Recording by Uday Sagar A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramacharaka Chapter 1 The First Lesson The Eye In India, the candidates for initiation into the science of Raja Yoga when they apply to the yogi masters for instruction are given a series of lessons designed to enlighten them regarding the nature of the real self and to instruct them in the secret knowledge whereby they may develop the consciousness and realization of the real I within them. They are shown how they may cast aside the erroneous or imperfect knowledge regarding their real identity. Until the candidate masters this instruction or at least until the truth becomes fixed in his consciousness further instruction is denied him for it is held that until he has awakened to a conscious realization of his actual identity he is not able to understand the source of his power and moreover he is not able to feel within him the power of the will which power underlies the entire teachings of Raja Yoga the yogi masters are not satisfied if the candidate forms merely a clear intellectual conception of this actual identity, but they insist that he must feel the truth of the same, must become aware of the real self, must enter into a consciousness in which the realization becomes a part of his everyday self, in which the realizing consciousness becomes the prevailing idea in his mind around which his entire thoughts and actions revolve. To some candidates, this realization comes like a lightning flash the moment the attention is directed toward it, while in other cases the candidates find it necessary to follow a rigorous course of training before they acquire the realization in consciousness. The yogi masters teach that there are two degrees of this awakening consciousness of the real self. The first, which they call the consciousness of the I, is the full consciousness of real existence that comes to the candidate and which causes him to know what he is a real entity having a life not depending upon the body, life that will go on in spite of the destruction of the body, real life in fact. The second degree, which they call the consciousness of the I am is the consciousness of one's identity with the universal life and his relationship to and in touchness with all life expressed and unexpressed. These two degrees of consciousness come in time to all who seek the path. To some it comes suddenly, to others it dawns gradually, to many it comes assisted by the exercises and practical work of Raja Yoga. The first lesson of the yogi masters to the candidates leading up to the first degree above mentioned is as follows. That the supreme intelligence of the universe, the absolute, has manifested the being that we call man, the highest manifestation on this planet. The absolute has manifested an infinitude of forms of life in the universe including distant worlds, suns, planets, etc many of these forms being unknown to us on this planet and being impossible of conception by the mind of the ordinary man. But these lessons have nothing to do with that part of the philosophy which deals with these myriad forms of life, for our time will be taken up with the unfoldment in the mind of man of his true nature and power. Before man attempts to solve the secrets of the universe without he should master the universe within, the kingdom of the self. When he has accomplished this, then he may and should go forth to gain the outer knowledge as a master demanding its secrets, rather than as a slave begging for the crumbs from the table of knowledge. The first knowledge for the candidate is the knowledge of the self. Man, the highest manifestation of the absolute, as far as this planet is concerned, is a wonderfully organized being. 
Although the average man understands but little of his real nature, he comprises within his physical, mental and spiritual makeup both the highest and the lowest. As we have shown in our previous lessons, the fourteen lessons and the advanced course, in his bones he manifests almost in the form of mineral life. In fact, in his bones, body and blood, mineral substances actually exist. The physical life of the body resembles the life of the plant. Many of the physical desires and emotions are akin to those of the lower animals, and in the undeveloped man these desires and emotions predominate and overpower the higher nature, which latter is scarcely in evidence. Then man has a set of mental characteristics that are his own, and which are not possessed by the lower animals. See 14 lessons. And in addition to the mental faculties common to all men, or rather that are in evidence in a greater or lesser degree among all men, there are still higher faculties latent within man, which when manifested and expressed render man more than ordinary man. The unfoldment of these latent faculties is possible to all who have reached the proper stage of development and the desire and hunger of the student for this instruction is caused by the pressure of these unfolding latent faculties crying to be born into consciousness. Then there is the wonderful thing, the will, which is but faintly understood by those ignorant of the yogi philosophy, the power of the ego, its birthright from the absolute. But while these mental and physical things belong to man, they are not the man himself. Before the man is able to master, control and direct the things belonging to him, his tools and instruments, he must awaken to a realization of himself. He must be able to distinguish between the I and the not I. And this is the first task before the candidate. That which is the real self of man is the divine spark sent forth from the sacred flame. It is the child of the divine parent. It is immortal, eternal, indestructible, invincible. It possesses within itself power, wisdom and reality. But like the infant that contains within itself the sometime man, the mind of man is unaware of its latent and potential qualities and does not know itself. As it awakens and unfolds into the knowledge of its real nature, it manifests its qualities and realizes what the Absolute has given it. When the real self begins to awaken, it sets aside from itself those things which are but appendages to it, but which it, in its half-working state, had regarded as itself. Setting aside first this and then that, it finally discards all of the not I, leaving the real self free and delivered from its bondage to appendages. Then it returns to the discarded appendages and makes use of them. In considering the question, what is the real self? Let us first stop to examine what man, usual, what man usually means when he says I. The lower animals do not possess this I sense. They are conscious of the outer world, of their own desires and animal cravings and feelings. But their consciousness has not reached the self-conscious stage. They are not able to think of themselves as separate entities and to reflect upon their thoughts. They are not possessed of a consciousness of the divine spark, the ego, the real self. The divine spark is hidden in the lower forms of life, even in the lower forms of human life, by many sheets that shut out its light. But nevertheless, it is there always. It sleeps within the mind of the savage. Then, as he unfolds, it begins to throw out its light. In you, the candidate, it is fighting hard to have its beams pierce through the material coverings. When the real self begins to arouse itself from its sleep, its dreams vanish from it, and it begins to see the world as it is, and to recognize itself in reality, and not as the distorted things of its dreams. 
the savage and barbarian are scarcely conscious of the I. They are but a little above the animal in point of consciousness, and their I is almost entirely a matter of the consciousness of the wants of the body, the satisfaction of the appetites, the gratification of the passions, the securing of personal comfort, the expression of lust, savage power, etc. In the savage, the lower part of the instinctive mind is the seed of the I. See 14 lessons for explanation of the several mental planes of man. If the savage could analyze his thoughts, he would say that the I was the physical body, the said body having certain feelings, wants and desires. The I of such a man is a physical I, the body representing its form and substance. Not only is this true of the savage, but even among so-called civilized men of today, we find many in this stage. They have developed powers of thinking and reasoning, but they do not live in their minds, as do some of their brothers. They use their thinking powers for the gratification of their bodily desires and cravings, and really live on the plane of the instinctive mind. Such a person may speak of my mind or my soul, not from a high position where he looks upon these things from the standpoint of a master who realizes his real self, but from below, from the point of view of the man who lives on the plane of the instinctive mind and who sees above himself of the higher attributes. To such people the body is the I. Their I is bound up with the senses and that which comes to them through the senses. Of course, as man advances in culture and civilization, his senses become educated and are satisfied only with more refined things, while the less cultivated man is perfectly satisfied with the more material and gross sense gratification. Much that we call cultivation and culture is not but a cultivation of a more refined form of sense gratification instead of a real advance in consciousness and unfoldment. It is true that the advanced student and master is possessed of highly developed senses, often far surpassing those of the ordinary man. But in such cases, the senses have been cultivated under the mastery of the will and are made servants of the ego instead of things hindering the progress of the soul. They are made servants instead of masters. As man advances in the scale, he begins to have a somewhat higher conception of the I. He begins to use his mind and reason, and he passes on to the mental plane. His mind begins to manifest upon the plane of intellect. He finds that there is something within him that is higher than the body. He finds that his mind seems more real to him than does the physical part of him. And in times of deep thought and study, he is able almost to forget the existence of the body. In this second stage, man soon becomes perplexed. He finds problems that demand an answer. But as soon as he thinks he has answered them, the problems present themselves in a new phase, and he is called upon to explain his explanation. The mind, even although not controlled and directed by the will, has a wonderful range, but nevertheless, Man finds himself traveling around and around in a circle and realizes that he is confronted continually by the unknown. This disturbs him, and the higher the stage of book learning he attains, the more disturbed does he become. The man of backlidal knowledge does not see the existence of many problems that force themselves before the attention of the man of more knowledge and demand an explanation for him. The tortures of the man who has attained mental growth that enables him to see the new problems and the impossibility of their answer cannot be imagined by one who has not advanced to that stage. The man in this stage of consciousness thinks of his I as a mental thing, having a lower companion, the body. He feels that he has advanced, but yet this I does not give him the answer to the riddles and questions that perplex him, and he becomes most unhappy. Such men often develop into 
pessimists and consider the whole life as utterly evil and disappointing, a curse rather than a blessing. Pessimism belongs to this plane, for neither the physical plane man or the spiritual plane man have this curse of pessimism. The former man has no such disquieting thoughts, for he is almost entirely absorbed in gratifying his animal nature, while the latter man recognizes his mind as an instrument of himself rather than as himself, and knows it to be imperfect in its present stage of growth. He knows that he has in himself the key to all knowledge, locked up in the ego, and which the trained mind cultivated developed and guided by the awakened will may grasp as it unfolds knowing this the advanced man no longer despairs and recognizing his real nature and his possibilities as he awakens into a consciousness of his powers and capabilities he laughs at the old despondent pessimistic ideas and discards them like a worn-out garment man on the mental plane of consciousness is like a huge elephant who knows not his own strength. He could break down barriers and assert himself over nearly any condition or environment, but in his ignorance of his real condition and power, he may be mastered by a punny driver, or frightened by a rustling of a piece of paper. When the candidate becomes an initiate, when he passes from the purely mental plane onto the spiritual plane, he realizes that the I the real self is something higher than either body or mind, and that both of the latter may be used as tools and instruments by the ego or I. This knowledge is not reached by purely intellectual reasoning, although such efforts of the mind are often necessary to help in the unfoldment, and the masters so use it. The real knowledge, however, comes as a special form of consciousness. The candidate becomes aware of the real I, and this consciousness being attained, he passes to the rank of the initiates. When the initiate passes the second degree of consciousness and begins to grow into a realization of his relationship to the whole, when he begins to manifest the expansion of self, then he is on the road to mastership. In the present lesson, we shall endeavor to point out to the candidate the methods of developing or increasing the realization of this I consciousness. This first degree work, we give the following exercises or development drills for the candidate to practice. He will find that a careful and conscientious following of these directions will tend to unfold in him a sufficient degree of the I consciousness to enable him to enter into higher stages of development and power. All that is necessary is for the candidate to feel within himself the dawn of the awakening consciousness or the awareness of the real self. The higher stages of the I consciousness come gradually, for once on the path there is no retrogression or going backward. There may be pauses on the journey, but there is no such thing as actually losing that which is once gained on the path. This I consciousness even in its highest stages, is but a preliminary step toward what is called illumination, and which signifies the awakening of the initiate to a realization of his actual connection with the relation to the whole. The full sight of the glory of the eye is but a faint reflected glow of illumination. The candidate, once that he enters fully into the eye consciousness, becomes an initiate, and the initiate who enters into the dawn of illumination takes his first step upon the road to mastery. The initiation is the awakening of the soul to a knowledge of its real existence. The illumination is the revelation of the real nature of the soul and of its relationship with the whole. After the first dawn of the eye consciousness has been attained, the candidate is more able to grasp the means of developing the consciousness to a still higher degree, is more able to use the powers latent within him to control his own mental states, to manifest a center of consciousness and influence that will radiate into the outer world, which is always striving and hunting 
for such centers around which it may revolve. Man must master himself before he can hope to exert an influence beyond himself. There is no royal road to unfoldment and power. Each step must be taken in turn, and each candidate must take the step himself and by his own effort. But he may and will be aided by the helping hand of the teachers who have travelled the path before him and who know just when the helping hand is needed to lift the candidate over the rough places. We bid the candidate to pay strict attention to the following instruction as it is all important. Do not slight any part of it for we are giving you only what is necessary and are stating it as briefly as possible. Pay attention and follow the instruction closely. This lesson must be mastered before you progress and it must be practiced not only now but at many stages of the journey until full initiation and illumination is yours. End of chapter 1 The First Lesson The I Part 1 Recording by Uday Sagar Chapter 2 of A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga The First Lesson The I Part 2 Rules and Exercises Designed to aid the candidate in his initiation. The first instruction along the line of initiation is designed to awaken the mind to a full realization and consciousness of the individuality of the I. The candidate is taught to relax his body and to calm his mind and to meditate upon the I until it is presented clearly and sharply before the consciousness. We herewith give directions for producing the desired physical and mental condition in which meditation and concentration are more readily practiced. This state of meditation will be referred to in subsequent exercises, so the candidate is advised to acquaint himself thoroughly with it. State of meditation. If possible, retire to a quiet place or room where you do not fear interruption so that your mind may feel secure and at rest. Of course, the ideal condition cannot always be obtained, in which case you must do the best you can. The idea is that you should be able to abstract yourself, so far as is possible, from distracting impressions, and you should be alone with yourself, in communion with your real self. It is well to place yourself in an easy chair or on a couch, so that you may relax the muscles and free the tension of your nerves. You should be able to let go all over, allowing every muscle to become limp until a feeling of perfect peace and restful calm permeates every particle of your being. Rest the body and calm the mind. This condition is best in the earlier stages of the practice. Although after the candidate has acquired a degree of mastery, he will be able to obtain the physical relaxation and mental calm whenever and wherever he desires but he must guard against acquiring a dreamy way of going around wrapped in meditation when he should be attending to the affairs of life remember this the state of meditation should be entirely under the control of the will and should be entered into only deliberately and at the proper times the will must be master of this as well as of every other mental state the initiates are not daydreamers but men and women having full control of themselves and their moods. The eye consciousness while developed by meditation and consciousness soon becomes a fixed item of consciousness and does not have to be produced by meditation. In time of trial, doubt or trouble the consciousness may be brightened by an effort of the will as we shall explain in subsequent lessons without going into the state of meditation. The realization of the I. The candidate must first acquaint himself with the reality of the I before he will be able to learn its real nature. This is the first step. Let the candidate place himself in the state of meditation as heretofore described. Then let him concentrate his entire attention upon his individual self, shutting out all thought of the outside world 
and other persons. Let him form in his mind the idea of himself as a real thing, an actual being, an individual entity, a sun around which revolves the world. He must see himself as a center around which the whole world revolves. Let not a false modesty or sense of depreciation interfere with this idea, for you are not denying the right of others to also consider themselves centers. You are, in fact, a center of consciousness, made so by the absolute, and you are awakening to the fact. Until the ego recognizes itself as a center of thought, influence, and power, it will not be able to manifest these qualities. And in proportion, as it recognizes its position as a center, so will it be able to manifest its qualities. It is not necessary that you should compare yourself with others, or imagine yourself greater or higher than them. In fact, such comparisons are to be regretted, and are unworthy of the advanced ego, being a mark and indication of a lack of development rather than the reverse. In the meditation, simply ignore all the consideration of the respective qualities of others and endeavor to realize the fact that you are a great center of consciousness, a center of power, a center of influence, a center of thought, and that, like the planet circling around the sun, so does your world revolve around you, who are its center. It will not be necessary for you to argue out this matter, or to convince yourself of its truth by intellectual reasoning. The knowledge does not come in that way. It comes in the shape of a realization of the truth gradually dawning upon your consciousness through meditation and concentration. Carry this thought of yourself as a center of consciousness, influence, power with you, for it is an occult truth, and in the proportion that you are able to realize it so will be your ability to manifest the qualities named. No matter how humble may be your position, no matter how hard may be your lot, no matter how deficient in educational advantages you may be, still you would not change your I with the most fortunate, wisest and highest man or woman in the world. You may doubt this, but think for a moment and you will see that we are right. When you say that you would like to be this person or that, you really mean that you would like to have their degree of intelligence, power, wealth, position, or what not. What you want is something that is theirs, or something akin to it. But you would not, for a moment, wish to merge your identity with theirs, or to exchange selves. Think of this for a moment. To be the other person, you would have to let yourself die, and instead of yourself, you would be the other person. The real you would be wiped out of existence, and you would not be you at all, but would be he. If you can but grasp this idea, you will see that not for a moment would you be willing for such an exchange. Of course, such an exchange is impossible. The eye of you cannot be wiped out. It is eternal. It will go on and on and on to higher and higher states, but it always will be the same I. Just as you, although a far different sort of person from your childhood self, still you recognize the same I is there and always has been there. And although you will attain knowledge, experience, power and wisdom in the coming years, the same I will be there. The I is the divine spark and cannot be extinguished. The majority of people in the present stage of the race development have but a faint conception of the reality of the I. They accept the statement of its existence and are conscious of themselves as an eating, sleeping, living creature, something like a higher form of animal. But they have not awakened to an awareness or realization of the I, which must come to all who become real centers of influence and power. Some men have stumbled into this consciousness or a degree of it without understanding the matter. They have felt the truth of it and they have stepped out from the ranks of the commonplace people of the world and have become powers for good or bad. This is unfortunate to some extent as this awareness without the knowledge 
that should accompany it may bring pain to the individual and others. The candidate must meditate upon the eye and recognize it, feel it, to be a center. This is his first task. Impress upon your mind the word I in this sense and understanding and let it sink deep down into your consciousness so that it will become a part of you. And when you say I, you must accompany the word with a picture of your ego as a center of consciousness and thought and power and influence. See yourself thus, surrounded by your world. Wherever you go, there goes the center of the world. You are the center, and all outside of you revolves around that center. This is the first great lesson on the road to initiation. Learn it. The yogi masters teach the candidates that their realization of the I as a center may be hastened by going into the silence or state of meditation and repeating their first name over slowly, deliberately and solemnly a number of times. This exercise tends to cause the mind to center upon the eye, and many cases of dawning initiation have resulted from this practice. Many original thinkers have stumbled upon this method without having been taught it. A noted example is that of Lord Tennyson, who has written that he attained a degree of initiation in this way. He would repeat his own name over and over, at the same time meditating upon his identity, and he reports that he would become conscious and aware of his reality and immortality, in short, would recognize himself as the real center of consciousness. We think we have given you the key to the first stage of meditation and concentration. Before passing on, let us quote from one of the old Hindu masters. He says regarding this matter, when the soul sees itself as a center surrounded by its circumference, when the sun knows that it is a sun and is surrounded by its whirling planets, then is it ready for the wisdom and power of the masters. The knowledge of the independence of the I from the body. Many of the candidates find themselves prevented from a full realization of the I even after they have begun to grasp it, by the confusing of the reality of the I with the sense of the physical body. This is a stumbling block that is easily overcome by meditation and concentration. The independence of the I often becoming manifest to the candidate in a flash upon the proper thought being used as subject of meditation. The exercise is given as follows. Place yourself in the state of meditation and think of yourself, the real I, as being independent of the body, but choosing the body as a covering and an instrument. Think of the body as you might of a suit of clothes. Realize that you are able to leave the body and still be the same I. Picture yourself as doing this and looking down upon your body. Think of the body as a shell from which you may emerge without affecting your identity. Think of yourself as mastering and controlling the body that you occupy and using it to the best advantage, making it healthy, strong and vigorous, but still being merely a shell or covering for the real you. Think of the body as composed of atoms and cells which are constantly changing, but which are held together by the force of your ego and which can improve at will. Realize that you are merely inhabiting the body and using it for your convenience just as you might use a house. In meditating further, ignore the body entirely and place your thought upon the real I that you are beginning to feel to be you. And you will find that your identity, your I, is something entirely apart from your body. You may now say, my body, with a new meaning. But do not let this conception and realization cause you to ignore the body. You must regard the body as the temple of the spirit and care for it and make it a fit habitation for the I. Do not be frightened if during this meditation you happen to experience the sensation of being out of the body for a few minutes and of returning to it when you are through with the exercise. The ego is able in the case of the advanced initiate of soaring above the confines of the body but it never severs its connection at such times. It's merely as if one were to look out of the window of room seeing what is going on outside and drawing in his head when he wishes. 
He does not leave the room, although he may place his head outside in order to observe what is doing in the street. We do not advise the candidate to try to cultivate this sensation, but if it comes naturally during meditation, do not fear. Realizing the immortality and invincibility of the ego, while the majority accept on faith the belief in the immortality of the soul, yet but few are aware that it may be demonstrated by the soul itself. The yogi masters teach the candidates this lesson as follows. The candidate places himself in the state of meditation, or at least in a thoughtful frame of mind, and then endeavors to imagine himself as dead. That is, he tries to form a mental conception of himself as dead. This at first thought appears a very easy thing to imagine, but as a matter of fact it is impossible to do so, for the ego refuses to entertain the preposition and finds it impossible to imagine it. Try it for yourself, you will find that you may be able to imagine your body as lying still and lifeless, but the same thought finds that in so doing you are standing and looking at the body. So you see that you are not dead at all, even in imagination although the body may be. Or, if you refuse to disentangle yourself from your body, in imagination you may think of your body as dead, but you who refuse to leave it are still alive and recognize the dead body as a thing apart from your real self. No matter how you may twist it, you cannot imagine yourself as dead. The ego insists upon being alive in any of these thoughts and thus finds that it has within itself the sense and assurance of immortality. In case of sleep or stupor resulting from a blow or from narcotics or anesthetics, the mind is apparently blank, but the eye is conscious of a continuity of existence, and so one may imagine himself as being in an unconscious state or asleep quite easily and sees the possibility of such a state. But when it comes to imagining the eye as dead, the mind utterly refuses to do the work. This wonderful fact that the soul carries within itself the evidence of its own immortality is a glorious thing, but one must have reached a degree of unfoldment before he is able to grasp its full significance. The candidate is advised to investigate the above statement for himself by meditation and concentration, for in order that the eye may know its true nature and possibilities, it must realize that it cannot be destroyed or killed. It must know what it is before it is able to manifest its nature. So do not leave this part of the teaching until you have mastered it. And it is well occasionally to return to it in order that you may impress upon the mind the fact of your immortal and eternal nature. The mere glimmering of this conception of truth will give you an increased sense of strength and power and you will find that your self has expanded and grown and that you are more of a power and center than you have heretofore realized. The following exercises are useful in bringing about a realization of the invincibility of the ego, its superiority to the elements. Place yourself in the state of meditation and imagine the eye as withdrawn from the body. See it passing through the tests of air, fire and water unharmed. The body being out of the way, the soul is seen to be able of passing through the air at will, of floating like a bird, of soaring, of traveling in the ether, it may be seen as able to pass through fire without harm and without sensation, for the elements affect only the physical body, not the real eye. Likewise, it may be seen as passing through water without discomfort or danger or hurt. This meditation will give you a sense of superiority and strength, and will show you something of the nature of the real eye. It is true that you are confident in the body, and the body may be affected by the elements, but the knowledge that the real eye is superior to the body, superior to the elements that affect the body, and cannot be endured any more than it can be killed, is wonderful and tends to develop the full eye consciousness within you. For you, the real eye, are not body, you are spirit. The ego is immortal and invincible and cannot be killed and harmed. When you enter into this realization and consciousness, you will feel an influx of strength and power impossible to describe. Fear will fall from you like a worn-out clock, and you will feel that you are born again. An understanding of this thought will show you that the things that you have been fearing cannot affect the real eye.
but must rest content with hurting the physical body. And they may be warded off from the physical body by a proper understanding and application of the will. In our next lesson, we will be taught how to separate the I from the mechanism of the mind, how you may realize your mastery of the mind, just as you now realize your independence of the body. This knowledge must be imparted to you by degrees, and you must place your feet firmly upon one round of the ladder before you take the next step. The watchword of this first lesson is I, and the candidate must enter fully into its meaning before he is able to progress. He must realize his real existence independent of the body. He must see himself as invincible and impervious to harm, hurt or death. He must see himself as the great center of consciousness, a sun around which his world revolves. Then will come to him a new strength. He will feel a calm dignity and power which will be apparent to those with whom he comes in contact. He will be able to look the world in the face without flinching and without fear for he will realize the nature and power of the I. He will realize that he is a center of power, of influence. He will realize that nothing can harm the I, and that no matter how the storms of life may dash upon the personality, the real I, the individuality, is unharmed. Like a rock that stands steadfast throughout the storm, so does the I stand through the tempests of the life of personality. And he will know that as he grows in realization, he will be able to control these storms and bid them be still. In the words of one of the yogi masters, the eye is eternal, it passes unharmed through the fire, the air, the water, sword and spear cannot kill or wound it, it cannot die. The trials of the physical life are but as dreams to it. Resting secure in the knowledge of the eye, man may smile at the worst of the world has to offer, and raising his hand he may bid them disappear into the mist from which they emerged. Blessed is he who can say understandingly, I. So, dear candidate, we leave you to master the first lesson. Be not discouraged if your progress be slow. Be not cast down if you slip back a step after having gained it. You will gain too at the next step. Success and realization will be yours. Mastery is before you will attain, you will accomplish peace be with you. Mantrams, affirmations for the first lesson. I am the center, around me revolves my world. I am the center of influence and power. I am the center of thought and consciousness. I am independent of the body. I am immortal and cannot be destroyed. I am invincible and cannot be injured. End of the first lesson, the I. Part 2 Recording by Uday Sagar Section 3 of A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Rama Charaka The Second Lesson the Ego's Mental Tools, Part 1. The first lesson we gave instruction and exercises designed to awaken the consciousness of the candidate to a realization of the real I. We confined our instructions to the preliminary teachings of the reality of the I and the means whereby the candidate might be brought to a realization of his real self and its independence from the body and the things of the flesh. We tried to show you how you might awaken to a consciousness of the reality of the I its real nature, its independence of the body, its immortality, its invincibility and invulnerability. How well we have succeeded may be determined only by the experience of each candidate, for we can but put out the way, and the candidate must do the real work himself. But there is more to be said and done in this matter of awakening to a realization of the I. So far, we have but told you how to distinguish between the material coverings of the ego and the I itself. We have tried to show you that you had a real I, and then to show you what it was, and how it was independent of the material coverings, etc. But there is still another step in this self-analysis, a more difficult step. Even when the candidate has awakened to a realization of his independence of the body and material coverings, he often confounds the I with the lower principles of the mind. 
This is a mistake. The mind, in its various phases and planes, is but a tool and instrument of the eye, and is far from being the eye itself. We shall try to bring out this fact in this lesson and its accompanying exercises. We shall avoid and pass by the metaphysical features of the case, and shall confine ourselves to the yogi psychology. We shall not touch upon theories, nor attempt to explain the cause, nature, and purpose of the mind, the working tool of the ego, but instead shall attempt to point out a way whereby you may analyze the mind, and then determine which is the not I, and which is the real I. It is useless to burden you with theories or metaphysical talk, when the way to prove the thing is right within your own grasp. By using the mind, you will be able to separate it into its parts, and force it to give you its own answer to the questions touching itself. In the second and third lessons of our fourteen lessons, we pointed out to you the fact that man had three mental principles, or subdivisions of mind, all of which were below the plane of spirit. The I is spirit, but its mental principles are of a lower order. Without wishing to unduly repeat ourselves, we think it better to run hastily over these three principles in the mind of man. First, there is what is known as the instinctive mind, which man shares in common with the lower animals. It is the first principle of mind that appears in the scale of evolution. In its lowest phases, consciousness is but barely perceptible, and merely sensation is apparent. In its higher stages, it almost reaches the plane of reason or intellect. In fact, they overlap each other, or, rather, blend into each other. The instinctive mind does valuable work in the direction of maintaining animal life in our bodies, it having charge of this part of our being. It attends to the constant work of repair, replacement, change, digestion, assimilation, elimination, etc., all of which work is performed below the plane of consciousness. But this is but a small part of the work of the instinctive mind. For this part of the mind has stored up all the experiences of ourselves and ancestors in our evolution from the lower forms of animal life into the present stage of evolution. All of the old animal instincts, which were all right in their place and quite necessary for the well-being of the lower forms of life, have left traces in this part of the mind which traces are apt to come to the front under pressure of unusual circumstances, even long after we think we have outgrown them. In this part of the mind are to be found traces of the old fighting instinct of the animal, all the animal passions, all the hate, envy, jealousy, and the rest of it, which are our inheritances from the past. The instinctive mind is also the habit mind, in which is stored up all the little and great habits of many lives, or rather such as have not been entirely effaced by subsequent habits of a stronger nature. The instinctive mind is a queer storehouse, containing quite a variety of objects, many of them very good in their way, but others of which are the worst kind of old junk and rubbish. This part of the mind also is the seat of the appetites, passions, desires, instincts, sensations, feelings and emotions of the lower order, manifested in the lower animals, primitive man, the barbarian, and the man of today, the difference being only in the degree of control over them that has been gained by the higher parts of the mind. There are higher desires, aspirations, etc., belonging to a higher part of the mind, which we will describe in a few minutes, but the animal nature belongs to the instinctive mind. To it also belong the feelings belonging to our emotional and passional nature. All animal desires, such as hunger and thirst, sexual desires, on the physical plane. All passions, such as physical love, hatred, envy, malice, jealousy, revenge, etc., are part of this part of the mind. The desire for the physical, unless a means of reaching higher things, and the longing for the material, belong to this region of the mind. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, belong to the instinctive mind. Take note, however, that we are not condemning the things belonging to this plane of the mind. All of them have their place. Many were necessary in the past, and many are still necessary for the continuance of physical life. All are right in their place, 
and to those in the particular plane of development to which they belong, and are wrong only when one is mastered by them, or when he returns to pick up an unworthy thing that has been cast off in the unfoldment of the individual. This lesson has nothing to do with the right and wrong of these things. We have treated of that elsewhere. And we mention this part of the mind that you may understand that you have such a thing in your mental makeup, and that you may understand the thought, etc., coming from it, when we start in to analyze the mind in the latter part of this lesson. All we will ask you to do at this stage of the lesson is to realize that this part of the mind, while belonging to you, is not you, yourself. It is not the I part of you. Next in order, above the instinctive mind, is what we have called the intellect, that part of the mind that does our reasoning, analyzing, thinking, etc. You are using it in the consideration of this lesson. But note this. You are using it, but it is not you, any more than was the instinctive mind that you considered a moment ago. You will begin to make the separation if you will think but a moment. We will not take up your time with a consideration of intellect or reason. You will find a good description of this part of the mind in any good elementary work on psychology. Our only idea in mentioning it is that you may make the classification, and that we may afterward show you that the intellect is but a tool of the ego, instead of being the real I itself, as so many seem to imagine. The third and highest mental principle is what is called the spiritual mind, that part of the mind which is almost unknown to many of the race, but which has developed into consciousness with nearly all who read this lesson. For the fact that the subject of this lesson attracts you is a proof that this part of your mental nature is unfolding into consciousness. This region of the mind is the source of that which we call genius, inspiration, spirituality, and all that we consider the highest in our mental makeup. All the great thoughts and ideas float into the field of consciousness from this part of the mind. All the great unfoldment of the race comes from there. All the higher mental ideas that have come to man in his upward evolutionary journey that tend in the direction of nobility. True religious feeling, kindness, humanity, justice, unselfish love, mercy, sympathy, etc. have come to him through his slowly unfolding spiritual mind. His love of God and of his fellow man have come in this way. His knowledge of the great occult truths reach him through this channel. The mental realization of the I, which we are endeavoring to teach in these lessons, must come to him by way of the spiritual mind unfolding its ideas into his field of consciousness. But even this great and wonderful part of the mind is but a tool, a highly finished one, it is true, but still a tool to the ego or I. We propose to give you a little mental drill work toward the end that you may be able more readily to distinguish the I from the mind or mental states. In this connection, we would say that every part, plane, and function of the mind is good and necessary, and the student must not fall into the error of supposing that because we tell him to set aside first this part of the mind and then that part, that we are undervaluing the mind, or that we regard it as an encumbrance or hindrance. Far from this, we realize that it is by the use of the mind that man is enabled to arrive at a knowledge of his true nature and self, and that his progress through many stages yet will depend upon the unfolding of his mental faculties. Man is now using but the lower and inferior parts of his mind, and he has within his mental world great unexplored regions that far surpass anything of which the human mind has dreamed. In fact, it is part of the business of Raja Yoga to aid in unfolding these higher faculties and mental regions. And so far from decrying the mind, the Raja Yoga teachers are chiefly concerned in recognizing the mind's power and possibilities, and directing the student to avail himself of the latent powers that are inherent in his soul. It is only by the mind that the teachings we are now giving you may be grasped and understood, and used to your advantage and benefit. We are talking direct to your mind now, and are making appeals to it, that it may be interested and may open itself to what is ready to come into it from its own higher regions. We are appealing to the intellect to direct its attention to this great matter, that it may interpose less resistance to the truths that are waiting to be projected from the spiritual mind, which knows the truth. 
End of the second lesson, The Ego's Mental Tools, Part 1. Recording by Lee Smalley.